So I'm Josh, I'm a member here, um, and as Ruth just said, the topic of my talk today is going to be discussing morality and how our hormones impact morality. Brief, but that's a very complicated topic, so hopefully, hopefully what I have planned for you today will help you uh, elaborate a little bit on, on the topic. Um, I'm stealing or borrowing with pride a little bit of Steve's talk from last week as an introduction for this. Um, so what I'd like to do is have you all close your eyes real quick for me. Now picture yourself, you're on a bridge overlooking some train tracks. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and on those train tracks are walking five very innocent people. And you notice behind them, barreling down on top of them, is a train. This train is moving at 80, maybe 100 miles an hour. You can't tell from your distance. But you know that those people are surely going to die in the train. But conveniently, on the bridge next to you, there happens to be a switch. and you notice that it's a lever, and that lever will redirect the train onto an alternate route. Looking down, you assess the situation, you notice, okay, on that alternate route, though, there's a one innocent person standing on the tracks. And if you divert the train to save the five, you will inevitably kill the one, most assuredly. So, by a show of hands, I just wanted to ask all of you, you can keep your eyes closed, by a show of hands, how many of you would flip the switch and divert the train? <laughs> okay, so, so you know, you, you can't see it, but all but two of you would do that, uh, would take that action. And, and, and that's consistent, that's the, that's the action that most people choose um, after some deliberation. But, now let's change the scenario just a little bit. Okay, keep your eyes closed if you don't mind. You're on that same bridge, same train, same five innocent people walking on the tracks. Except this time there's no alternate route. That train's bearing down on them and it's sure to kill them if it hits them. But, on the bridge in front of you, there happens to be a heavyset gentleman who you know somewhat from the neighborhood. And he's so heavy set though that you know if you push him off the bridge in the right time frame, he'll stop the, the engine and save the lives of those five people. But this heavy set gentleman, he will most assuredly die. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you pushed the gentleman over on and off the bridge? Oh, okay. I'm not the somebody off the Okay. So that's really that that's very interesting. That's the point I wanted to make. So there was only two hands that went up, and both of those hands happened to be the hands of children. <laughs> interesting. <Wow. laughs> All right, so don't choose children. They're not even strong enough to push that guy. <laughs> I mean, if you can stop the train, then yeah, how would you push him off? The that's bridge? what I'm saying. Like, I can push, and then I just lost the neighbor. Okay, so the good, so the good, yeah, it's physics, you know. So the, so the good news there is that you're all pretty normal. <laughs> We're all pretty normal. But given those two scenarios, a sociopath would act the same way in both scenarios. And the way that a sociopath would act is that a sociopath would say, one for five, saving five lives is, is more valuable logically than saving one life. So why the difference in judgment? So a sociopath would take about the same amount of time to deliberate on both of those scenarios as you all took to deliberate on that first scenario. And they would come to the same conclusion that you all came to 
in the same scenario. They would actually flip the lever, or in this case, they would throw somebody over a bridge and throw some to save the lives of five other people. Ver seemingly very logical. So what's actually going on here in the minds of a sociopath versus our minds? Um, because superficially, if you look at it logically, the two scenarios are the same. But most people, about 80%, would see the different would see the difference in those two situations. So we would see and act accordingly. We would act differently. Um, but this highlights a reality, a biological reality, that is seldom discussed. And that is, as human beings, our neurobiology, we're not actually exclusively rational or logical, and we're not exclusively emotional or intuitive. In fact, the way we're built, we make judgments and decisions emotionally and rationally simultaneously. That's the way our brains are actually constructed. So the sociopath will sacrifice his neighbor instead of himself. It would never occur to a sociopath to throw himself off the bridge or to throw both himself and his neighbor off the bridge. So he essentially makes the selfish choice. He's not worried about himself at all. He's worried about whether he's going to sacrifice one life or five. If he had jumped off the bridge to stop the train or if he had joined his neighbor and they both jumped off the bridge, to stop the train, he'd be a hero. Um, but that's not what a sociopath would do. That might be what you and I would do. So what's going on? <laughs> well, what is the what are the implications of this really for us as atheists or evolutionists or moralists? Um, so what seems to govern altruistic behavior and what makes a sociopath different from the rest of us? in terms of altruism, cold and calculating. So the answer may be hidden in biology and the observation that Charles Darwin made all the way back in 1873. He said that groups with a greater number of courageous, sympathetic, and faithful members who were always ready to warn each other of danger or to aid and defend each other would spread and be victorious over other tribes. This, in the modern day, in fact, the last 10, even more recently, the last five years, um, has been linked to a hormone known more for maternal and infant bonding, known as oxytocin. So studies in neuroendocrinology and social neuroscience are providing more and more evidence that there's an intimate link between our pro-social behavior and oxytocin. So as I said, oxytocin has a well-established role in reproduction. It also has a really well-established role in pair bonding formation, so spousal formation and then maternal and infant bonding. But the recent work suggests that there's a lot broader scope uh, to oxytocin, and it plays a critical role in the formation and maintenance of parochial cooperation. That's actually what Darwin called it. So parochialism, as Darwin called it, he said serves individual and group survival, both in our ancestral history and our contemporary societies. And its practice likely evolved from mammalian neurobiology, all the way back to oxytocin. Oxytocin being the likely hormonal modulator of parochialism because of three very specific reasons. It facilitates social categorization. So that means is it lets us say who's in our group and who's out of our group. It's what triggers the neurobiology behind that. And it enables trust to develop, typically within groups but also sometimes out-group. And it upregulates our concern for others, hence the necessity for infant bonding, uh, reproduction, and then pair bonding. 
<coughs> so as people, as human beings, we have evolved quickly the capability to distinguish friend from foe, um, in group from out group. And we do that with social discrimination by familiarity. Oxytocin drives that familiarity, whether it be by proximity, by monogamy, by touch, by scent, by massage, by handshake, hug, or even just a simple eye gaze. That increases our oxytocin levels and feelings of intimacy between one another. So there was an interesting study done back in 2009 that discussed familiarity, what makes us actually feel like somebody's in our group or that we're members of, of the same group. We're kin or teammates, if you will. What, he, what they did is they actually gave intranasal um, oxytocin to a number of participants in the study and they gave placebo to the other half. They invited them in to look at pictures of faces. And in looking at the pictures of faces, they were asked just to, just to glance over pictures of faces. And then they invited the participants back. The cohort or the group of participants that actually was given the oxytocin scored much higher on familiarity points. So when they were surprised with a recognition test the very next day. So what does this indicate? Well, it indicated to the researchers that oxytocin increases our ability to discern and recognize familiar things. There was no necessary recollection differences, so they didn't remember the names of the people. But the people who have the oxytocin definitely recommended, uh, uh, remembered that they saw these people in, in pictures prior. That means automatically, in our minds, we're thinking that those people are more familiar to us. They become in-group, or they become neighbors, or acquaintances, whatever you want to say. And that's the key to the social characterization that creates friends and neighbors and that bonding. So neural tracts in our brain, specifically the inferior frontal gyrus, and this is going to be names that I don't even remember, so I'm just going to give them to you. That, but the inferior frontal gyrus, the inferior parietal lobe, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the temporoparietal junction, and the medial temporal lobe, these are all areas of the brain involved in what we know as empathy. And empathy is actually more pronounced with in-group members than with out-group members. And so oxytocin triggers these areas of the brain, and an infusion of oxytocin upregulates our empathy and our concerns for other group members. This basically is increasing trust between in-group members, and it enables us to engage in a cooperation to benefit others so an individual with an oxytocin surge is more likely to cooperate with others in a way that could actually enact a personal cost to themselves. So importantly, self-sacrifice may include those tendencies to risk oneself to protect others or to jump off the bridge to save those five people with the train barreling down the top. What's interesting is, so what makes heroes? Well, oxytocin also enhances the behavior of our other in-group members. If we do that self-sacrificial exercise, it makes reciprocated cooperation likely in the members of individual groups or a tribe. So, what that means is their family would protect my family if I were to take my own life in saving their own. Very simply, they would be indebted or they would feel like they were indebted. And all of that is related back to oxytocin and a very complicated hormone cascade that goes on in the brain. So, while oxytocin is adaptive for altruistic response within groups, 
Its capacity to trigger intimacy seems context specific. And that may not always lead to um, better human nature in all cases. So to explain a little bit, in another study, the researchers took a group of people and they separated them into teams. And these team members were shown faces of potential allies that were morphed into either high threat or low threat categories. The high threat allies were considered very high in dominance rating, but very low in trustworthiness. The low threat group or cohort was designated as very high in trustworthiness, but very low in dominance. When talking about in-group and out-group for team intra-group competition, males that were given oxytocin selected for the high threat allies for their group. So that makes sense, right? So you want your allies or your brothers in the military, for instance, or your teammates to be able to scare the other side. You want them to be able to be the ones that everybody is frightened to actually go into battle with or to do competition with. That is also governed by a, an oxytocin increase. So, just to recap, oxytocin down regulates fear and anxiety and enables trust to develop, especially within individuals that are familiar and or categorized as in-group members. <coughs> it does motivate empathic concern, in-group favoritism, and parochial cooperation, all things we may consider to be morality building, all things we may consider to be altruistic. But it does motivate non-cooperation towards potentially threatening outgroups. So as Darwin observed, human self-sacrifice and cooperation will serve in-group functioning thereby enhancing individual prosperity and survival within group. And accordingly, our brain seems to have evolved an oxytocin response to sustain an in-group cooperation and an in-group protective mechanism that, if needed, would create competition towards rival outgroups or others, enemies people that we don't consider friends. But that creates a duality that can be problematic. So, just to finish up my sermon, I just want you all to consider the, the train scenario again. But let's look at it in a slightly different way. Close your eyes for me again if you would. And picture that bridge, picture the same train tracks, and really, really picture this this time, what you would actually do. And think about what I've just shared with you about oxytocin and how it affects our neurochemistry. We're actually setting up two populations, an us population standing on the bridge and a them population on the tracks. And most of us will treat the population we belong to fairly, but we're actually more uncaring about the unrelated population. That's actually an adaptive, an adaptive mechanism that's beneficial to our long-term health and survival. Um, it's an adaptive mechanism that sociopaths don't typically share. So, one of the reasons we don't throw our big, heavy-set neighbor off the bridge is because we know him. He's one of us. But now, keep your eyes closed, and if you don't have them closed, please close them. Picture this neighbor who is standing in front of you on the bridge, the one you may or may not push over to save the other five strangers. Picture this person as an elderly man in a wheelchair. Picture him, remember, five healthy strangers. 
<laughs> and a man in a wheelchair. Picture him as a diabetic. Picture him as homeless. Okay. You got it? You have the image in your head. Okay. Now I want you to I want to switch frame a little bit. Now picture him as a fireman. Okay. Picture him as a police officer. Now picture him as your favorite movie star. So does any of that change your mind about throwing him off the bridge? It shouldn't, but of course it does. And actually, it does for very beneficial reasons to our human population. It does because of what oxytocin is doing to your neurochemistries right now. <coughs> <coughs> but this kind of highlights why divisive political and religious practices can be so destructive within organizations because they shred that sense of belonging to a community um, and that can be necessary for the basis of successful human organizations it can be ba it's the basis of a successful community and society that parochial cooperation needs to be expanded out, and it can. Successful coalitions are often broad, and people see a shared interest, but they also see shared membership. So whether it's possible to build a coalition like that, of atheists, agnostics, and secular humanists, well, I think that can happen. It remains to be seen, but I'm, I'm enjoying my time with you here today, and I you're enjoying your time with me. Um, regardless of what kind of system develops, though, it, the evidence is pretty clear that if you assign the highest moral value to selfish acts or selfishness, it's not successful in long term because no one, no humans are actually happy in that scenario. No mammals are actually functioning optimally in that scenario. And evolutionarily, based on oxytocin and a lot of other variables, uh, it's just not healthy long-term moralistically. And when comparing cooperation or kin altruism or whatever you want to call it in the context of evolutionary success, cooperation is always more successful in the long term with in-group especially, than competition is. And the world is just much less daunting with someone else to share it with. So, that concludes my talk. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Thank you.